Hello and welcome to topic 11, lecture one. And in this topic, we're gonna be learning about the Constitution and evidence investigation. So what are we gonna be covering in this lecture? Well, in this lecture, we're first gonna talk about the rights of the criminally accused and the intersection of the rights of the criminally accused with the criminal justice process. Um, we're in the last two topics for our semester. And both of these topics uh, deal with the rights of the criminally accused. So I want to make sure that we have a good overview of the rights of the criminally accused as it relates to the criminal justice process, because that's what you're going to be learning about in these last two chapters for this class. Um, and, and, and so in, in this week, we're going to be looking particularly at the Fourth Amendment and um, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of uh, police searches and seizures. Um, and so we're going to, you know, start that work in this lecture by taking a look at what the Fourth Amendment is and the two clauses that are in the Fourth Amendment. Um, so that's what we're going to do in this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to take a look at specific cases as it relates to the Fourth Amendment search and seizure clause. So that's what we've got on the docket. So let's get started. So um, as you'll learn in these last two chapters, that uh, substantial portions of the Bill of Rights um, are dedicated to dealing with the rights of the criminally accused. And so let's do an overview of the rights that you're going to be the, that the rights that you're going to be learning about and the amendments in the Bill of Rights that you're going to be learning about in these, in these last two chapters. Um, and so the fourth amendment is the amendment that deals with search and seizures. And so police engage in searches in order to get um, to in, get evidence that somebody has engaged in a crime. It's important that when we live in a democratic society that we are able to keep people safe and people who are engaging in criminal and harmful um, activities, you know, basically need to be kept in check because they are violating the social contract. Uh, and so the Fourth Amendment deals with the issue of searching individuals and also um, warrants for those searches and arrests. Of the Fifth Amendment, there are a lot of things in the, the Fifth Amendment, um, but many of the things that are in the Fifth Amendment apply directly to the rights of those accused of crimes. Um, the Fifth Amendment says that your life, liberty, and property cannot be taken away without the due process of law. And so almost all of the criminal justice um, procedures are governed by, not just most, but all of the criminal justice procedures are governed by the, um, uh, by the due, proce due process clause in the Fifth Amendment and also in the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment talks about grand juries. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It, the Fifth Amendment says that you can't be tried twice for the same crime, uh, double jeopardy. And it also says that you can't be compelled to testify against yourself or to incriminate yourself. And so the right to remain silent or the self-incrimination clause. Uh, the Sixth Amendment, uh, so next week we're going to be, so while this week we're looking at the Fourth Amendment search and seizure and the Fourth Amendment right to remain silent um, clause, um, next week we're going to be looking at both the, um, the trial rights, in particular we'll be focusing on the assistance of counsel and to what extent we have the right to counsel to assist us in our criminal trials. And so the Sixth Amendment is all about the, um, uh, the rights that you have during trial. And then the Eighth Amendment also deals with the rights of the criminally accused um, uh, that, f for one, if you are found uh, guilty of committing a crime, you cannot be punished in a cruel or unusual manner. And also um, that if you are subject to a fine as a criminal penalty, it must not be excessive. And if you're waiting trial um, and that you're bound over to await for your trial and prepare for your trial and you're kept in jail, um, that the bail that is, uh, that is set in order to make sure that you either come back to um, your, uh, if you're released, that you, know, you could lose your bail if you don't come back for your future hearings. Um, or if you can't make the bail, then you have to just sit in county jail while you're preparing for trial that that bail cannot be excessive. Now, you know, the excessive bail is interesting because even a minor amount of bail, a lot of people cannot make, but regardless, it is in the Eighth Amendment. And so all of these are the, the, the rights that you'll be learning about for the next two weeks. So why is so much of the Bill of Rights dedicated to the rights of those accused of crimes? 
Um, well, the reason is, is it's because of, in part, because of the framers' experience. Um, those who framed our Constitution and wrote the Bill of Rights, um, they, they knew and experienced the excessive power of the state when it relates to criminal matters. Um, and it, it, during the Revolutionary War, um, that they were subject to being charged for a crime and never being told what that crime was, um, secret trials where they weren't allowed to be present and the trials were not public, um, uh, you know, uh, being held without being told why you're being held. So the framers uh, experienced what it's like to for the state to. Um, you know, exercise its powers against those that they they view are, um, you know, engaged in criminal activity. And so they they experienced that abuse of power firsthand. Um, they also just knew that, the, you know, that uh, the state is, is mighty. And so um, that uh, the state has a lot of power. The state has a lot of money that it uses in order to fight crime. Um, and that they know, uh, you know, our framers were very mindful. Our whole constitution is organized in, in such a way uh, to uh, basically place checks on the power of government. The whole Bill of Rights is that thou shall not telling government what it cannot do. The, you know, the, 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 the way we divide powers between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judiciary is all about making sure that one branch cannot abuse its power because it's going to have the oversight of, of the other branches. And we even divide power between the national government and the federal government, the federal government and the states. Again, another way to check power. And so, you know, the making sure that the rights of the, the accused is embedded in our Bill of Rights is, is one a reflection of the concern that the state will abuse its power. However, um, that, that um, so while the state is mighty and the individual is weak, that those who are accused of crimes are especially weak. Um, oftentimes, those who commit crimes are mentally unwell, um, have addiction problems, poor, unemployed, on the outskirts, out, outcasts within society. Um, and even if you're not in one of those categories, once a person's accused of a crime, a lot of people just assume, eh, they must be guilty. And so that it's, it, that, 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 you know, the framers were very aware of needing to beef up the protections of the individual, particularly of those who are accused of crimes, because those are the ones that are going to be most likely preyed upon by the power of the state. Oh, and I'll just say one final thing too, that when you have a robust protections for the, those who are accused of crimes, when they are found guilty, um, that, that we have, can have confidence that they are in fact guilty because there were many rights that they had to, to protect them. So the fact that you can call witnesses for your defense, the fact that, that you cannot be coerced into um, uh, testifying against yourself, the fact that you get a, an impartial jury, right? Um, you know, all of that says that when we, and that you have the right to counsel, when we have all of those things in place, when law enforcement can't search you without probable cause or a warrant, um, that when we have all of those things in place, when a person is in fact convicted and then sentenced, that we have confidence in the system that it, that, that, it, that it was done according to, um, you know, due process, that people got a fair shake. Now, we know that it falls short. We know that there's implicit bias. We know that there's class bias in our criminal justice system. Sorry if I'm getting passionate. I teach criminal justice as well. Um, and so I know that there are flaws. But regardless that, you know, these are in the Bill of Rights and that people who feel like their power, that their rights have been trampled upon, they always have that by their sides in order to fight for protection from the excessive power of the state. All right, so let's turn our sights now to the intersection of the rights of the accused that's in the Bill of Rights and the criminal justice process. And I know that there are some people in this class who have taken my criminal, my, my, the politics of crime and punishment that I teach. And so some of this will be a refresher. Maybe some of you, others of you have taken criminal justice classes. So um, you might be aware of the criminal justice process, but for others, it may be new. So it's kind of good to go over this either as a refresher or as just new information, because a lot of the cases that that you're gonna be reading about in the next two weeks really deal with the criminal justice process. So if you know what happens in the criminal justice process, you're gonna have a better understanding of how these, um, these amendments, these rights in the fourth, the fifth, and the, the, the eighth, um, how they play themselves out on the ground in terms of the criminal justice process. Okay, 
So um, uh, when I teach criminal justice, uh, that you know we talk about the different stages within the criminal justice process. Okay, um, and so you know really this, uh, the criminal justice process starts with the commission of crimes, and then it ends all the way to the point of corrections and uh, a release back into the society, as. You know my students know and as you probably know um very few crimes are actually reported to police um or not very few about 50 percent of crimes that are committed are reported to the police and you know once you know reported to the police you know making its way through all of the steps in the criminal justice process really uh, often does not happen right many people are not charged uh you know uh, um, uh some people uh, if charged they take off and are never held responsible uh, many plead guilty and never exercise their trial rights okay and, and so we have these stages but offenders really usually don't go through all of those stages and that's kind of a good thing right i mean if you don't have enough evidence to charge then you shouldn't charge somebody with a crime so let's look at the stages talk a little bit about each of them and then talk about the interlap the overlap of those uh these stages and the um and the bill of rights okay so the police stage stage one um you know this is basically the cops uh, and so police are responsible for having some initial contact with people uh, who just walk in on this, the beat and seeing people engaged in potentially criminal activity. People might call in something to the cops, you know, hey, someone's going to my neighborhood, come and investigate. So cops make initial contact. They will investigate a crime. If as a process of that investigation, there is probable cause that it's reasonable to believe that somebody is engaged in a criminal activity, they can arrest that person and then they take them down to the, the police station and book them, okay? And then at that point, the the individual is handed over to the prosecutor. So what are the, uh, the how do, what are the civil liberties that relate to the police stage? Well, um, when police engage in an investigation, they are governed by both the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. Um, that the Fourth Amendment uh, governs uh, what uh, constitutes a search and um, uh, and that you need to, uh, that the search must be reasonable um, and that that is usually translated into a reasonable search is predicated upon probable cause. Um, that based on the evidence, it's reasonable to think somebody engaged in a criminal activity. Um, and so the Fourth Amendment governs search and seizure of law enforcement. And also, uh, you know, a search is asking people questions. Once the cops are questioning you, they take you down, they arrest you, and they begin the process of interrogation, um, you uh, have the right to remain silent. You have the right to not self-incriminate yourself. And so the Fifth Amendment plays a role in the police stage as well. Um, the, 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 the Sixth Amendment, uh, that there's the right to counsel clause, and that at the point of arrest, um, the Supreme Court has said that you need to be apprised of your rights. One, that you have the right to remain silent, but also that you have the right to counsel at the point of arrest and everything moving forward from there. So um, the fourth and the fifth for the police stage. Um, once an individual is arrested, then they're turned over to the prosecutor, the prosecutor, and that's the pr prosecutorial stage. Um, the prosecutor is like the, our district attorney, John Chisholm in, um, in, in Milwaukee, Susan Eppers in uh, Waukesha, and they're basically an elected uh, official who serves as the attorney for the, the county. Uh, and so that uh, as uh, the uh, attorney for a county, they're... Uh, responsible as a state employee to um, uh, 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 to execute the law, to hold people accountable for breaking the law. So in the prosecutorial stage, we also have prosecutors at the federal level as well. Um, and so what the prosecutor does is they say, okay, somebody's been arrested, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be charged. And so um, that they have to make a decision, are they gonna actually charge somebody with the crime? If they make that decision, there are a bunch of pretrial hearings um, that include like a preliminary hearing, um, but it also includes a pretrial hearing is the arraignment uh, where you're basically brought in and you're told what you're being charged with. You're asked to enter a, into a plea and then bail will be set. Uh, and then also in the prosecutorial stage that m m many times when people are charged with a crime, they plead not guilty. Um, but then they'll engage in a plea bargaining agreement between the uh, the prosecutor and the defense attorney, sort of saying, okay, my client's willing to plead guilty to lesser charges and with the hope that there will be a lesser sentence, okay? So all of that is included in that second stage, the prosecutorial stage. How does the Bill of Rights come into this? Um, well, the, the decision to prosecute, um, the grand jury clause comes into play from the Fifth Amendment. 
Um, the Fifth Amendment says that you have the right to a grand jury. It's actually never been incorporated to the states. So at the state level, you usually get a preliminary hearing, not a grand jury. But if it's a federal, uh, uh, if it's a federal offense, you have the right to a grand jury. And basically, what a grand jury is is it's a, a group of people, uh, like a big, big jury. It doesn't determine a verdict, but it determines whether or not, uh, not the evident the prosecutor has enough evidence to indict somebody, to charge somebody with a crime. And so the grand jury is actually a check on the power of the prosecutor. The prosecutor wants to charge somebody, but they've got to demonstrate probable cause, and they demonstrate that through a grand jury. Uh, and that is a provision, a check on the power of the state um, in the Fifth Amendment. Uh, during re arraignment uh, that you are uh, brought and told uh, with what you're being charged with. And that's part of the Sixth Amendment, that person will be accused, will be notified of what they're being accused of. And then the Eighth Amendment is bail. It says that a, a excessive bail will not be um, set. But as I mentioned before, uh, even if bail is not so-called excessive, a lot of people cannot make bail, which is a real problem in the United States. But it's, you know, I mean, there's pros and cons to bail. Take my class if you want to learn more about the problems with bail. Um, but again, the Eighth Amendment, uh, you know, provides some provisions uh, for uh, the, uh, preventing the use of excessive bail. Okay, so the next stage is the trial stage. So um, you're arrested, the prosecutor decides to charge you. You um, enter a plea and you decide to enter not a plea of not guilty. And you decide that you do not want to engage in a plea bargaining. You feel like you have not committed this crime, you know you haven't, you're gonna take your chances with a trial. Now, um, and that, that's the trial stage. And so that would include um, selection of a jury, the trial itself, the sentencing, and then usually also not necessarily in the trial stage, but in the court stage would include an appeal as well. But I just, that's sort of like post conviction, um, but I just um, put it in there because an appeal will take place, not in a trial, but it will take a place in an appellate court, as you guys all know. Um, and so uh, is, uh, now to keep in mind that, uh, you know, only about 10% of those who are charged with the crime actually exercise their trial rights. That's one of the problems with plea bargaining, that when you plea bargain and you plead guilty to a, a crime, you basically waived your Sixth Amendment rights. Um, and so, you, you know, keep that in mind. Your textbook will be talking about that. So the Fifth Amendment um, applies to purple, the trial stage, um, because you have the right to, you cannot be forced to testify against yourself. And so you have the choice as the criminally accused about whether or not you want to testify at your trial. Um, the Sixth Amendment, purple trials, that you have a speedy, you have a right to a speedy and public trial. You'll be learning about what speedy and public means. Um, that you have a right to an impartial jury of your of basically the people that live in the place that you've committed your crime. And so jury selection. The six says that you have the right to confront the witnesses that the prosecution brings to against you. And so you actually get to cross-examine the prosecutor's witness. It's called the confrontation clause. And that you, it also says that you have a, co a compulsory process for obtaining your own witnesses. Um, and so that you have uh, the criminal accused have the right to bring their own witnesses to help exonerate them in, in order to or you know raise reasonable doubt about the state's um a claim that you've committed a crime and then uh the eighth amendment uh is sentencing you cannot be sentenced to a cruel and unusual punishment we're going to learn though that um, we're going to be learning about what constitutes a cruel and unusual punishment it's usually considered a punishment that's not proportionate to the crime you're going to be learning that the that the the death penalty is in and of itself has not been um, deemed uh, like inherently cruel and unusual pu punishment, uh, and then also you can't be subject to a, a excessive fines uh, either. Both of which are in the eighth, and then finally um, in appeals uh, that you um, that the, the double jeopardy clause applies from the Fifth Amendment that you cannot be tried twice for the same crime. We learned about that earlier this semester about whether or not double jeopardy is one of these fundamental rights that needs to be um, applied to the states and incorporation. And the Supreme Court initially said no, but then they, they changed their mind. And so um, the state cannot appeal your, um, your uh, acquittal. If you're found not guilty, it stops there. Um, also, you know, as a part of um, just the whole, uh, you know, criminal justice process that the prosecutor can't um, try you again uh, if you have been acquitted. 
Uh, and so in the correction stage is the last one so that once you are convicted and you're sentenced, um, that, um, uh, that all of that is governed by the eighth, that, that the punishment that you receive cannot be, um, cruel and unusual. And, and, and also that, um, that those who work in the correctional facilities cannot engage in cruel and unusual treatment of prisoners. Overarching the entire criminal justice process is the due process clause of the fifth uh, the Fifth Amendment and also the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, due process is the is the concept we've talked about this earlier in the semester that the state must operate within the law. No one the, no one is above or be, below above or be, be, below the law, including members of the criminal justice establishment. Um, and that due process uh, provides for fair procedure and due process uh, makes sure that the rights of people, even those who are criminally accused. Um, that they have rights that are respected. So the, four, the, the, the due process clause of the fifth and the 14th amendment are in effect throughout the whole criminal justice um, process. So hopefully this will give you an overview of like what you're gonna be learning. And so when they're talking about a grand jury or they're talking about a speedy trial or they're talking about appeals, et cetera, jury uh, selection, you get a sense of how it fits into the overall scheme. I just wanted to draw to your attention that there is a handy dandy table in your textbook that basically summarizes what we just talked about in terms of the intersection of the Bill of Rights and the criminal justice process. Okay, so this brings us to the Fourth Amendment, the first amendment that we're gonna be taking a look at as it rela relates to the rights of the criminally accused. And let me just put up the language of the Fourth Amendment here and then we'll read it and then talk about it. So the Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated. That's what's known as the reasonable clause. And what that clause is telling us is that people can be subject to searches by the state, but they cannot be subject to unreasonable searches. And so the court is always trying to determine well, what constitutes a reasonable search? Because as Chief Justice Roberts says, the touchstone of the Fourth Amendment is the concept of reasonableness. The other uh, part of the Fourth Amendment is known as the Warrants Clause. And that says that, and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And so uh, it's saying that when a, a warrant is, is, is obtained in order to search somebody, that it must be based on probable cause, that it's reasonable to believe that somebody engaged in a crime. It's a lower a burden of proof than the one that's used in a criminal trial, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, that it's going to be supported by somebody other than the police. Um, you know, if you let police say, hey, yeah, we got probable cause and, you know, they write the warrants. Well, it's not a very good check on the power of the police. And so that uh, the, that it will be supported by oath of affirmation. And that is, you know, going to be issued by a judge, signed off by a judge. And that the warrant has to be specific. It can't just say, search whatever you want. Um, that the, the search has to be related to the probable cause that is supporting the crime. So that what is going to be searched, that, that it must be described, the place that's going to be searched, the persons and the things that are going to be searched and seized, uh, and then all of that not, must be related to the probable cause of the crime. And so you've got the reasonable clause and the warrants clause that make up the Fourth Amendment. So why does the government need to conduct searches? Why does the government need to seize contraband or seize people in terms of their arrest? Um, well, we live in a democracy, and a democracy means that um, you know, or uh, that that the state basically has an obligation to stop and punish those who commit crimes. It's a part of the social contract. Uh, in a democracy, the people who live in a democracy they agree that they are going to follow the rules, um, and that in exchange, the government is going to punish those who do not follow the rules, right? And so the, you know, the state has to have the, has the obligation to make sure that safety is, 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 is kept, that people feel safe and secure in their homes and their places out in the street. Um, and in order to do that, they need to punish those who are bringing about harm to others. You can have all the rights you want written in the Bill of Rights, but if you can't go outside and feel safe in your neighborhood to, 
you know, go and do the things and pursue happiness and pursue your own freedom, then you really don't live in a democracy. And so for the government to be able to search people and arrest people who are harming others, it's a, it's a very important component of any society, including a democracy. Uh, and so investigations are a, 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 a crucial part of, of criminal justice. Uh, but it's also a crucial part of living in a democratic society. Now, it's easy for an authoritarian government to, you know, crack down on crime and keep people safe um, and to investigate crimes and arrest people who are up to no good or because they don't have any rules to follow, right? In an authoritarian government, there are no limits that are placed on the power of the government. They might have a constitution, but it's not followed. And also the rights of the people, there, there aren't any rights, or if there are rights, they are not abided by. So hell, it's easy to keep your country safe because the, the in an authoritarian regime, because the government can determine whoever they think is harmful, an enemy to the state, they can crack down on them. And there are no rules uh, regarding limitations put it on investigating crime, searching people, trying people, et cetera. Uh, but you know, authoritarianism makes a mockery of justice, right? I mean, that when people don't have any rights and the government doesn't have any limits on their power and the government can do whatever it wants, that justice does not exist in that kind of system. So in a democracy, it's really essential that um, that all aspects of the criminal justice process are, are, are governed by the due process of law, including investigation, right? So there has to be a known and fair process. We have to have rights of those who are accused of crimes and police and those doing the investigating uh, the investigation, they have to follow those rules as well. And so the, the Fourth Amendment is a part of this due process as it places constraints on government as it's investigating crimes. Okay, so we know the Fourth Amendment deals with search and seizure. What exactly is a search? Um, it seems like obvious, like, hey, a search is someone looking for something. But the word search that's in the Fourth Amendment is not just anyone looking for something. It has a very specific and distinct meaning in the context of the Fourth Amendment. And so when we talk about the word search, that you're not going to be subject to unreasonable search, um, that it, the Fourth Amendment is talking about the government doing the ser searching. Again, the Bill of Rights is about telling the government what it can't do, right? So just like with the First Amendment, right? The First Amendment applies to the government trying to curtail your speech, not to Twitter trying to curtail your speech because the First Amendment doesn't apply to Twitter. Um, and as you know, Elon Musk just bought Twitter. So that whole thing about disinformation and the free marketplace of ideas, well, we're gonna to get to see what that means under the helm of Elon Musk. Uh, but back to this, that this, the word search in the Fourth Amendment is a government agent's intrusion into a person's house, papers, and effects. It's known as a police search. So. Um, so we're, you know, a lot of times that in the, when you're reading these cases, the, the question will come up is, is the fourth amendment tr triggered? Is this search actually a police search? So here's just two examples or a, a couple of examples to like give you an example of what's not considered a police search. Therefore, it wouldn't be the fourth amendment would apply to this kind of search. And on the flip side, how, what is a police search? So. If an employer, let's say you have a job and that you're and you have a desk at, in your office at work, and your employment, your employer searches your desk, your work at desk, uh, your desk at work, right? Uh, thinks you're up to no good. Maybe they thought you stole something from the company. Um, the, you know, maybe you're selling trade secrets or something like that. And that, let's say that the employer searches your desk at work and they find something. Um, does the Fourth Amendment apply to that? No, it does not. It is not a police search. Why? Because an employer is not a, a government agent. And so therefore they are searching, but it's not a search that is covered by the Fourth Amendment. It doesn't trigger the Fourth Amendment. And in fact, it's legal for an employer to search an employee's uh, desk at work uh, because it's company property, it's private property, okay? And so the Fourth Amendment does not apply to that private search. How about if police come to your workplace and that um, they search uh, an employee's uh, work desk and let's say the employer has not given the police the, uh, the go ahead, hasn't given consent for a search to play, take place. 
Oh, uh, well, police searching employees work desk is a police search um, that it triggers the Fourth Amendment. Why? Because police are government agents and they are doing the searching. Now, the question is, is that a reasonable search or does it violate the Fourth Amendment? It could trigger the Fourth Amendment, but the question is, is it a reasonable search? If the employer gave the consent to do that search or the employee gave the consent to the search, it's probably reasonable. But if there is no probable cause, no exigent circumstances, no consent, it is likely that the fourth is triggered, but it would be an illegal, unreasonable search. But you'll be learning about that in the case law and in the, in the, the textbook for this week. So in conclusion for this lecture, the question that the court has wrestled with uh, over and over is really what is a search? Um, and uh, does the search, is it an intrusion into a physical space? Is that only what a search is? And so does the Fourth Amendment only apply to when cops come into your home or search through your personal effects in your home? Um, or is a search something more than just a simple physical trespass? Is a search more comprehensive? Is it, is it an intrusion into a place that you feel is private and that others feel like there's a reasonable expectation of privacy? Um, is that what a search is? And so to support the amendment, uh, apply to searches of places that are considered reasonably private, or is it really just a physical intrusion or is it both? Does the Fourth Amendment apply to both physical intrusions, physical trespasses, and to an, a, a, an intrusion into one's reasonable expectation of privacy? We're going to find out in the next lecture as we take a look at the key cases that give us insight to what a search is. All right, thanks a lot for your time and attention, and I'll talk to you again soon.